Welcome to the Brand Theory Podcast, the podcast for helping you uncover your passion, realize your purpose, and take the aligned action. Together, we're going to prove the theory that when we live our lives on brand, the possibilities become limitless. I'm your host, Danielle Marchesi, branding expert and business coach. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Brand Theory Podcast, where we bring you conversations of inspiration and high value, full of tips and tricks to help you on your brand and business journey, making sure that it is all aligned and authentic to who you truly are and where you want to be truly going to help you reach your destination sooner rather than later. If you did not catch last week's episode, we went in on doctoring your brand, basically, and taking your brand and your business to the doctor. I know that sounds super weird and super crazy, but just like we take ourselves to the doctor when we're either not feeling so great or it's time for that yearly checkup, our doctor is able to tell us, hey, we need to add this vitamin into your regimen. We need to make adjustments here to get you feeling better. We need to almost do the same thing with your brand and your business. You need to take it to that expert. You need to take it to that doctor. You need to take it to an outside perspective even if that is a friend, to just help you see the overarching story, the overarching strategies, if things are working or if they are not working. And if they're not working, what can we be doing to adjust your strategies, adjust your procedures, adjust your marketing, adjust your branding to get you closer to those results again sooner rather than later? So definitely check out that episode. And we are running a summer sale that is almost over on our brand audits, which is basically your opportunity to take your brand to the doctor. And I am your doctor. I gave myself a degree using, uh, you know, 18 seasons of Grey's Anatomy, but in a real um, background in branding over the last couple of years of diving into this brand world and obsessing over it. So I would be more than happy to help you navigate your next steps, your next strategies, your next procedures to get you closer to those results that you truly desire inside your brand and business. So let's get into today's episode. Of course, the lawnmower has started going outside, but I hope that you cannot hear that so much. Today, we are talking to Beate Chalet. She is a growth architect and founder of the Women's Code and provides visionaries and leaders with proven strategies, blueprints, and growth maps that provide clear steps to improve business systems, strengthen leadership skills and teams so that our clients and audiences can maximize profits and scale their profit, their impact. Beate is known as a straight shooter and her ability to inspire, empower, and overcome adversity. Her super skill is working with unique personalities and big thinkers and building executable systems. A first-generation immigrant who found herself in $135,000 in debt as a single parent, she bootstrapped her passion for photography into a global business that licensed content into 79 countries. She exited in a multi million dollar deal when she sold the company to none other than Bill Gates. She is a podcast host of the Business Growth Architect show and listed amongst the top 100 global thought leaders by People Hum and one of the 50 most must follow women entrepreneurs by HuffPost. A introduction that needs no further explanation and now the lawnmower is super loud. Let's get into today's episode. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Danielle, for having me. I'm excited to speak to you. Yes, I am excited to jump into this conversation of all things growth, business growth, personal growth, all the things. So as always, let's start this off as by telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey thus far. Thank you. So my name is Beata Chalette. I'm known as the growth architect, and I work with visionaries, leaders, that are ready for that next level of growth. And I'm the one who designs the blueprints, the strategies, the systems, all the stuff that I love so that the people I work with can make their uh, impact by helping them to scale and growing their authority. And I'm originally from Germany, so you probably hear a little bit of an accent still. And I, you know, been in the United States for a really long time. I've been a business owner by accident. I've been through a, you know, eight times disasters. I jokingly said I'm an eight time disaster survivor, fires, floods, riots, earthquakes, September 11th, the lawsuit, uh, who knew that I was going to add a pandemic to it. And, uh, you know, and it, and the hits just kept coming and I ended up being $135,000 in debt. 
after I made some really bad decisions and, you know, just trying to figure out how the heck am I going to be a business owner? How am I going to feed my child as a single mom immigrant? And I eventually did crack the code and I sold my business for millions of dollars to Bill Gates. And now I'm here to help others to understand what some of these ideas, blueprints and strategies really are and to make it easy for people to understand that so they can take the steps to grow their business. I love it. And I want to dive into that code. <laughs> um, but was there, my next question is typically, was this something you always pictured doing? And it sounds like it definitely wasn't. So what was that moment for you or the series of moments? Give us a little bit of insight of when you kind of realized you you caught onto something big here and you were able to sell it. And what was that moment of, okay, this could actually work. I could do something with this. That's actually a, a, a good question. I like that because it's a little bit of a curveball question. It's like, was there a moment where you had the realization? I think what happens is that when you run a business, you have two choices. You are going to continue that middle-class thinking and you say incremental growth. If I do X uh, and I do more of X, then I'm going to run the numbers. It's called the realistic uh, uh, growth plan. And so if you were to increase your numbers by 20%, let's say you make $250,000 in sales right now, 20%. Um, so now you're going to get to $300,000 and you, you just kind of keep that going. And then somebody comes and says, hey, you ever heard of quantum leaps? And you go, uh, what? And they say, well, you know that, that if it exists in nature, it must be possible. If it's possible, it should be possible for you. And now suddenly your whole mind is blown and you go, wait, 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 what's this idea? So that suddenly there's a burst of energy between two things that lead to these so-called quantum leaps where people then suddenly you know, blow up their businesses you know, that's the famous overnight success story that was 13 years in the making. And so I realized that in business, there is, there's a formula, which is why I am a strategist, because I want to repeat these formulas for my clients, is there is a formula of success that is comprised out of mindset, out of growth and understanding growth, and out of strategy. So with these three things in place, it is completely possible to uh, start scaling your business in a completely different way to achieve these kinds of quantum leaps. And so for me, the idea was, Danielle, that I was pushing sort of, I was, I was a photographer rep. Then I realized that that was not big enough. Then I was a, a photography producer, still photography producer. I produced for Wrangler, Levi Strauss, BMW. I mean, big clients, mm -hmm. but it's exhausting. It's physically exhausting. You're the first one out in the morning. You're the last one to come in at night and you still have to do the production book and all the bookings while you're out in the field all day. And I knew that there was only a question of time until I physically couldn't do that anymore. I mean, I had great time. It was amazing. But I will, I'm not going to want to do that when I'm 60. That's just, you know, that's great when you're 30. And then I realized that that was too much work. And there was a lot of money that ran through, but I didn't make enough money. So I was, I kept looking for that thing that was related to what I knew how to do, which is photography, being creative, and to learn how to take that and turn that into a quantum leap. And that's how I arrived at stock photography. And I was is specialized in architectural and interior photography. And at that time, the at-home movement had literally just begun. And as a side effect of what I was doing, so I had learned to go after the A-listers first. You know, don't, don't bother with C, go straight to A. A knows how to make decisions. Uh, C, you know, is always about the money. So just go to the people, go to the people that already know they need this. So I did that. And then as a side effect, I got all these home stories at home stories, celebrity at home stories, which I didn't even thought of, think about. But because I was a photo editor at Elle magazine, I knew that I could sell these because I used to buy those stories. And that sort of gave me this idea of what I needed to do and how I stepped into it. And then suddenly that the, the quantum leap began. And then you know, a Bill Gates company comes and sees the value and says, can you teach us how to do it? And I said, no, if you want to know what I do, you're going to have to buy it. And they did. 
Okay. So tell us, don't just, you know, skip right over that. Tell us about <laughs> that, that conversation. And what was your initial thought when somebody reached out to you and asking you for that formula? And was it like a right away? No, you have to buy my business. Or did you kind of like go home, think about it a little bit and then kind of come back to them? So here's another uh, a piece of what you have to think about as a business owner. And that is, you need to have a number. And everybody needs to have a number. So if you're listening to this call, uh, to this podcast, you're watching it, you need to know your number. What is the number that if somebody gives you that number tomorrow, that you are willing and ready to sell your shop? I mean, everybody needs to know this. And here's why. Because the entire, the entire idea of building a business is to create an independent entity. And that's what I teach my private clients. And that's what we do in our mastermind and, you know, in our podcast amplification method is that you need to create an entity that has a value on its own. It needs to be away from you. It needs to be removed from you. When you have an entity that you are working with, right? I mean, you run it. I mean, you gave it the idea, which is why systems are so important. So we, you know, we have a system called the Five Star Success Blueprint in, in the Growth Architect because we know that the sellable piece or the teachable piece or the valuable piece, sure, it's my brain, but the idea is that the growth architecture is repeatable, it's scalable. So that's the, that's the objective of building a business is to push it away from you. That's the, the difference between the business owner and the business leader that comes at some time. So now when you walk into that and you say, I start this business because I want freedom. I don't want to work so hard. Now you only find out that you work more than you worked <laughs> before, but it's for yourself. So you, you, you kind of like figure a few things out along the way. And then there comes a the moment where you say, are you serious about this or not? And if you step into that next level decision-making, now you need to take this baby and you got to go, that baby's got to like walk out the door and go to college on its own. I don't have to be there 24 seven. That's when the strategy kicks in. That's when the system building kicks in. Then that's when all the processes, procedures, automation starts to begin to be, become really important. So this is the lead in to say, how did I know? I knew because that's how I set it up. Because after I lost my previous business in a lawsuit, to uh, a really horrible employee who had this idea how to run my business just without me with my key vendor, no less. I, I said, this was never gonna happen to me again. I was going to make sure that I was protecting my assets. I was protecting my intellectual property. I was protecting uh, who had client contact. I was protecting how I was running my business. And that's how I built up the stock photography syndication. So I was set up for that. And we had a very deliberate plan in the company to say, we know we are onto something. We, 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 we see the, 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 the need in the market. We see the niche. We see the demand is rising. And so we then designed a second brand because we saw at the time that photography was really shifting into becoming a commodity. And we built a brand that was more commodity brand. And at the launch party for that brand, at an industry event, that's when people started to notice that I was a serious player and that this was, this was coming up. And uh, we put the word out. I put the word out. I said, I'm interested in selling. And then uh, one thing led to another. And then the offer came in. But I knew my number. I knew I wanted to sell. I was ready for it. And so when, the, when that moment came, it wasn't like, oh, wow, the moment came. It was like the moment came. It was a natural, logical. It wasn't a, a matter of if, it was when. It was a when, yeah. I love that. So when you sell your business, does that mean your hands are completely out of it? Or did you do make a deal where you still kind of had a role to play in the company? Most of the time when there's an acquisition, or a merger, primarily on acquisitions on mergers, you typically, you know, merge two companies and you stay on, but on acquisition, typically there is a, a transition period where there's a hold back for the uh, purchase. 
So you are not getting paid 100% of what the purchase price is, but it's being held back one or two years to make sure that everything that you said is true. And okay. there is a typically six to 12 months period where you are part of the acquisition to ensure that everything is seamlessly handed over. But I love systems and strategy. So my systems were set up in such a way that um, they could just, you know, they could just take it and drop it into their system. And we did the acquisition. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, we were done in three months. And so, and then they made me an offer to stay on with a company for a, you know, for, for a longer a period of time to help them run their international celebrity division. And I did that for about two years, but ultimately, I'm just not an employee. I, <laughs> I, I find that it is very difficult for me as a person or the way my brain works to not have that immediate ability to respond. That's what makes me so good working with my clients when, when we map out systems because I can hear it and I can immediately implement it. And when you work in an organization, that's just not the case. Yeah, I get that. So after that whole Bill Gates story, is that when you started kind of what you're doing now? Or was there anything else in between there? Yeah, the joke is I retired for like a week. And <laughs> and um, I always felt that that because I went through a decade of bad luck and not small blows, but really big blows. I mean, people died and um, one of my key vendors vanished in a tsunami and that was, that was, I mean, I mean, who does this even happen to, right. Yeah. But it happened to me and who gets, you know, who, who is, who is in a lawsuit and who loses their business in September 11th, when there's a terrorist attack on America and, and, and riots fires, it, it just was crazy. And I kept thinking to myself, Danielle, somebody must derive a benefit of all this tragedy and bad luck that's happening. And then at the very end of it, my dad died. Mm -hmm. And, and you go like, this is just not normal. It's some, somebody must have a bigger plan. And then I realized that this was the prelude of something that I needed to, to do to, especially, you know, I have a soft spot for single moms, uh, single working moms, because I was one and I know how hard it is. And I have a soft spot for women because there's a lot in our education that is just terribly lacking into the way we show up in the world and our insecurities and imposter syndrome and our how quickly we allow others to erode our confidence because we just don't know what to say at the right time or we are on the defense. Women are constantly trained to uh, defend their right to even be in the room. It's just a, a game that society has put in front of women that women fall for and and fall in themselves and and continue to play and you know for men if they can take out half of their competition just by saying stupid shit i'm sorry then of course you know why 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 would they ever change that right. if half of the competition can't just be eliminated but just saying stupid stuff yeah amen sister <laughs> he said it as good as i could um Okay. So where were we anyway? <laughs> anyway, uh, so turning, I read something in your profile that said turning everything into an executable strategy. So now let's move into talking about, I guess, who do you help? Who is your clientele? What, when they come to you, what are their frustrations? At what level of business are they? And what are they looking to do next? Yeah. So, so my, my specialty is, so growth architecture is designed to go to 30,000 feet to take the plane and to take a look at the whole terrain. What are all the airports that we can land at? What's the trip that we want to take? A lot of times a business owner has a problem with saying, you know, I'm, I push, 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 push. I'm always reactive. I'm, I feel like I'm always running after my business. I'm never in front of it. So what we do is we, we, we go to 30,000 feet, we take a look and then we say, okay, there's three things that typically happen. You either don't have a system and that means that you are having different things that you do, right? So you as a brand specialist, so you may do consulting, you may do the actual work, 
you may uh, help them on a campaign, you might speak, you might, you know, you do a podcast. So there's different things. So somebody that looks at you and says like, well, but Danielle, so what are you? Are you like a podcast? Is that what you do? Or are you like a, a, a branding expert or, or are you an agency? Like, what are you? And so right. suddenly already the confusion. So I come in and I say, oh, we can fix that very easily. We just need an umbrella over it that, uh, that says, here's our umbrella. This is what the system is called. And under the system, we put all the puzzle pieces in and suddenly it's cohesive. So you could say to me as a business strategist, well, are you doing sales? Are you doing like with team building? What, what are you doing? Are you doing strategy systems? And then I say, well, I'm one of the few people that can even tell you where in your business the disconnect is because everybody else is, I call it so niche-sized mm. that they can't see the full picture, but it, that's my specialty. And then I can tell you what needs to be done to close the gaps because most businesses have, have a lot of the pieces in place. It's just not put together. So it is either the lack of the system or they are growing, but they are not sure how they can scale their growth because they don't know, you know, who they should hire next. They don't know what, you know, what these steps even are. They don't know um, how to map out a strategy, how to get leads in. I mean, there's like 50 ways to, to get leads in the door. So how are you going to fill that pipeline and what's, what's resonating with your personality? Because people oftentimes do stuff that they don't even like. And so I help them build out that growth plan. And then we have a, a program that is specifically for podcasters, where we now helping podcasters to do three things. And that's a mastermind that helps them to uh, maximize the content. So we have a, a, a system, a strategy to take these pieces of content and create multiple touch points out of it so that it's everywhere and monetize the podcast. Because if you have a podcast, why wouldn't you want to monetize it? So we have a monetization mm -hmm. strategy. And the third piece of that a program that we literally just finalized is an instant authority piece on Instagram, where we have developed the method uh, on how to go after more high level guests through your Instagram uh, piece so that you can elevate the level of the podcast, which then builds the authority, which gets you in a whole different room. I love that. I want to actually focus on the authority piece because I think that's very important about running a business, running a brand and running a, a visible brand. I feel like no matter if you offer sneakers or you offer high, high, high level services, one-on-one -on -one or group, positioning yourself in the, as an authority in your particular niche is so important. And especially in this online world where we can go read your website, watch a video, watch podcasts, read one of your captions. There's so many opportunities for us to position ourselves as an authority, but it can also feel overwhelming. So just wondering if in general, not necessarily just podcasting, what's, what are some of your tips for positioning ourselves, positioning businesses as the authority? Well, Gasp, you have to have a plan, um, a strategy <laughs> for that. So um, I think the, the the most commonly made mistake is that we get so sidetracked and we look at, I got to do the funny video dancing on TikTok. I got to do my Instagram reels. I got to do my, my Facebook lives. I got to do my LinkedIn lives. Now we have a LinkedIn newsletter. LinkedIn is coming up with an audio version. Uh, I got to do uh, the podcast. I have to do the uh, the quotes, the graphics, the personal posts. And then when you really look at the amount of content that you just, you know, said you're going to create, and then you take the podcast or you take your video and you turn it into a blog post, and then you turn that into an audiogram. And then you're going to, I mean, it's just it's endless. <laughs> just, I mean, I get tired just talking about yeah. it. So. So on the authority platform building to get instant authority, you need to be very clear. What is the platform your customers are at? So my clients are not on TikTok. I like watching TikTok videos because it makes me happy. I try to avoid going there because it's just too much time. Um, you know, next thing you know, you lost three hours of your day. And 
I uh, people search on on YouTube because it's the it's aside from Google, you know, the largest search engine in the world. So YouTube matters to us. LinkedIn matters to us. Facebook, not so much. That's not really our main main clientele, but Instagram is. So you want to be very clear, which are where is your customer? And so you need to first do this avatar and and just an, um, to make sure that I've covered that. If you don't have an avatar, that's our our offer. You know, we give that away for free. We just completely revamped it. It's, it's a multiple choice list. You'll you'll end up with your avatar. Go to airtightavatar.com, download that, and in 15 minutes you you have your 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 your, your avatar figured out. But without that, without you knowing who it is you're selling to, you don't know where they are. And if you don't know where they are, you can sell to them. And so you have to reverse engineer the strategy. You say, who am I selling to? Where are they? What resonates with them? What are their problems? And then and only then are we going to start to design our programs and our offer to help them to solve the issue that we know that we, that they have because we spoke to them. Most of the time with authority building, when it goes haywire, it is because there's a lack of clarity of who you are, what you do, not concise language of what it is that you offer and the problem that you solve. So it becomes this wild feeding frenzy Hmm. of just throwing stuff out that's not cohesive, that's not deliberate, that's not designed to achieve a particular purpose, and then you make the mistake of measuring engagement as, as on whether or not it's successful. And that's not even the way it works. Yeah. A lot of that is just for authority so that it looks credible to the buyers, but the strategy to get the buyers is very rarely on social media. And what do you say to people who are under the impression that they are nervous about constantly talking about the same thing? So say they've got three to five content pillars that wrap into their offers. I have seen so many people just turn off and then turn on when they're ready to launch again. But like, I feel like if we have something to say about that content pillar, or we have value to share. It shouldn't only be in our selling season. Yes. I think that that really uh, goes back to that. You don't have a system. And if you don't have a system, you don't understand it well enough to know all the facets that go into it because you've identified, you know, in the niche, the three pieces that you believe matter, but you don't really truly understand how that connects together and what all the other things are. So, you know, for example, so if I, if I, um, if my brand is confusing, then there's so many things that go into that brand building. So the brand could be confusing or unclear because I built the brand really for myself. So it looks good. But what if the brand doesn't resonate with a customer? So you have the customer it has to resonate with. Then it has to resonate with the people that you're working with because you're building a culture. So if there's a disconnect, I mean, there's so many things can go wrong. So now as you're building your brand and you have these three pillars, don't just make it about the obvious. People know the obvious stuff. Mm. It's like, you know, ha- have you updated your logo in the last 10 years? Well, that's pretty obvious. That's not that's not brain surgery. But to say, have you even looked at the market right now? What's happening on how people are not trusting their brands and how, how disassociated they are from um, brands that are all about the money, how millennials, Gen Z specifically, doesn't uh, is not driven by money, that they're freaking out that the planet's going to die. They can't have a place to have their kids uh, grow yeah. up. And that's not reflected in your brand. And suddenly you have like 600 things to talk about. Here's how our brand helps you to, uh, to, to be socially conscious, to get these messages across. Um, how are you showing up? as the brand owner, as the brand ambassador, are we, are we bringing in brand ambassadors and to reflect our values? Have we even talked about our values? Is that on the website? Do we have a capability stack? So see, I, I just made up 50 things that I could talk about in two minutes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I started my business probably about five years ago now, coming up on five years and how I ran my business then and how I run my business now, particularly around content creation and conversations we're having online is vastly different 
And it's, it occurred to me in the last couple of weeks, how vastly different it is. It was, I grew up, grew up as an entrepreneur in the time of, um, kind of showcasing your lifestyle a bit of look what's possible and this and that great love it cool but today it's like it is not going to resonate with somebody at all my new coffee table like it's just not maybe it will with your your the audience you've had from the beginning but anybody new you're trying to reach it's just not about that anymore it's about these bigger social issues that are 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 here. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to take like a big political stance in your account if you don't want to, I don't think. But I think it's about recognizing, like you said, where the industry is now and where it's going and speaking from that place of authenticity and knowing that times are different. I, I, yes, 100%. And that you have, that you're recognizing that that's, that's a really powerful thing. So that's the part I think oftentimes business owners don't understand because they think that there is a place to get to. There is no place to get to. It is a destination, but the, there's a journey uh, with many, 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 many stops. And um, you know, we were doing a lot of women empowerment uh, conversations and keynotes and talks and conferences before the pandemic hit. And then the pandemic came and again, the whole, the whole business idea is wiped out. And now we have to step into something different, which is to help people uh, design these strategies, which I've always done, but that just wasn't the hero of the, of, of, of the brand. So we had to go back and say, well, what does this brand need to be today to be relevant to our clients? What are people really worried about? And so the, objective of look at me i'm driving a nice nice car i'm living in a house you know I, I i was able to send my daughter to college and she has no debt now she's getting married and i get to pay to pay for that uh that is all good and great but i think it causes a lot of social anxiety of people that don't understand the strategy or the roadmap i think a lot of internet marketers have really done a disservice to humanity in that sense of, of dangling their rented Ferraris and, and uh, you know, their lobster dinners on boats. It's like, okay, come on, come on, dude. That's like what, 1%, but that's not, that's not really a lifestyle that appeals to most people. That is a lifestyle that appeals to a very shallow, small group of people that want the toys because the toys get them recognition, the recognition gets them exposure to girls. And then, you know, they, they score all the hot girls. I mean, it's, it's like, yeah. that's so juvenile. It's not even funny. Right. Yeah. But for us as, as entrepreneurs, I think, and that's why we say, help you scale your impact and grow your authority because my impact is measured in the impact I help you make. So if I help you to put a strategy behind your business and now you can help brands because now you have a system, service more brands, help them to be better and reach more people. Now the ripple effect of my work with you, Danielle, now gets the, gets the effect that I want. That's the impact that I'm here to do. And when you shift it around, Suddenly, you know, like, oh my gosh, I can do so much more, but it is not, it's not this narcissistic egomaniac. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I mean, there yeah. is a, is a part of look at me. Don't get me yeah, wrong. And but- I think there's a way to do it very tastefully, tastefully, yeah. but there is definitely a difference between doing it tastefully and, and doing it with a, a look at me with it. But I'm glad we're on the same page with that. <laughs> 100%. But going back to your women empowerment, you wrote a book called Happy Women, Happy World. Tell us a little bit about that and how that kind of came into, into your journey. So Happy Woman, Happy World, I wrote because I, I realized that when I was working for this Bill Gates company in the corporate world, that there is such a discrepancy in how women are treated and how men are treated and everybody who says it isn't so it's it it's it's a fact it's just a fact i watched how men collaborate with each other how suddenly 
on Friday, you leave with, oh yeah, we got to figure this out on Monday. It's been figured out and you were not part of the conversation. You don't even know what happened. You don't know that the buddies, the bros went to the golf course and you know, had a couple of beers and all of this happened and you were not even anywhere, anywhere close to the action because nobody invited you in part of that. And I looked at that and I saw what, you know, how, how, how men eliminate, you know, women methodically, how women, many women themselves are buying into that uh, because they go, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm over 50. So when I was young, I would look at women like me and I would say, yeah, aging feminist. You know, that's, she really probably doesn't know how to handle men. And that's her problem because I don't have that problem. And so I, I myself played into that because, you know, it was cute, and young and sexy. I could dress up. I got the attention. I was smart, funny, charismatic. I went to the bar, the whole nine yards. And then you get older and you realize, oh my God, it's, it's the system, it's the structure that's built like that. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly young women look at me and they go, yeah, poorly aging feminists, you know, like I used to do that. And that's when you step in and you say, wait, this is, this is really wrong. It's, it's designed to perpetuate the disadvantage that women are in by women doing this to themselves and by men fueling and fostering that kind of behavior because it eliminates, it eliminates the competition. So I wrote the book, Happy Woman, Happy World, because I, I wanted to really start at the foundation and say to women, it's not me. Yeah. You know, I still love men. I'm still charismatic. You know, I mean, I'm still sexy for who I am and I still have a, you know, a great time in life. It's never been me. It's always been the structure that has these markers that we fall into. And so if we want to see permanent change and have women's rights, which we are seeing again, I mean, how can we even have these conversations again? I already fought that battle 30 years ago. You know, right. the people before me already fought that battle uh, right. 20 years before me. How can we, how is it possible that we get to the same battle over and over and over again? And it is for one reason, one reason only is that women do not learn from the women that have come before them because they blame them to look good in front of men and men continue to fuel that. So. I went and wrote the book and I said, if you want to start, you need to take responsibility for your own behavior. You need to, you're either going to be part of the problem. You're going to be part of the solution. I shared my experience with how I succeeded as a woman in a male dominated world, how I sold my company to Bill Gates, how I got the attention, how I, how I kept showing up. And so I wanted women to have an actual roadmap to understand how can you be successful and be a mother and be in a relationship and take care of yourself and on and on and on it goes. And that's, that's why I wrote the book. Well, I'll definitely be, uh, I added it to my Amazon cart before, <laughs> before we hopped on today. So definitely sounds completely right up my alley. And I'll link that below into the show notes for everyone to listen to. It's a very important conversation, especially with everything that's going on now. No matter your political viewpoint on things, there's comes down to things are changing for women and not necessarily always in the best way. And you're right. I think we need to take responsibility within our own kind of communities and do with that what you will, but I think it's very important to continue the conversation. So thank you for writing that and being an example for us. So kind of wrapping this all together, um, where are my last kind of question before getting into what are you working on now? Where can we find more of you is if we're feeling stuck in our businesses and we know we need something, we know we need structure, we know we need systems in place. Maybe we thought we had systems in place that just aren't really working. What is the first thing that we should do, be doing besides calling you? <laughs> I was just going to say, call me. Uh, <laughs> yes. So um, I think that uh, I, I would encourage somebody who is experiencing this to, to look at this from the perspective of opportunity, to say that 
obviously you pushed it as hard as you could with what you know how to do to this level. Now there's another layer and that other layer requires you to stretch and you'll probably have some stretch marks. You might get some bruises. Uh, you have to make moves you haven't practiced before because you didn't know you needed to. But to really think about what is that thing that I need to do to break through that barrier. Sometimes in mindset, there's it's called a terror barrier because that is when you, when you push through that limit of, of your old programming, because that's typically what happens at this point. So if you are at this point where you go like, I call it the income sign wave, it goes up and down. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Then you, you know, put the foot on the pedal, you find more clients, you work hard, you take the foot off because you're busy working, then you don't have a pipeline and then it starts all over again and just goes on and on and on and on. That means this is your signal in bright bolt letters flashing you need a system because you have to now start the detachment of yourself as the driver into the manager and start to design this business into the components that other people can handle. Now, then you go and you say, but I don't have the money because shouldn't I make the money first so that I can afford to do that? Well, that's not the way it works. The way it works is that when you say I'm ready, God, spirit, the universe, whatever you want to call it, tends to put this big, I call this the oh shit moment in front of you and says, here's your solution, but it costs you $25,000. Or here is, here's somebody who does this routinely and they're $10,000. And then you go, oh shit, uh, what do I do now? Uh, um, I wanted it. I asked for it. It arrived at my door, but uh, no. So that is the difference between breaking through that barrier and, and staying where you are forever. I mean, literally, I've seen this so many times. And if you were to truly believe that you're here destined for something great, that you've been activated, that you're here to make your impact, when the opportunity you ask for shows up, you better take it. Even though it might be daunting and it might be bigger, but that is what you need to stretch into in order to break through the terrier barrier and go to that next level. I'm in a mastermind now and um, people are offering programs that are 25,000, 40,000, 50,000, $100,000. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling on, on, on the numbers and people putting the money down. Yeah. And they do that because they have record, they have that pattern recognition to say, if I want to get to that level of asking for $25,000, if I want to get to the level of asking for $50,000, if I want to get the level to asking for gas, $100,000 for a job, I can't be sitting in my living room clipping coupons mm -hmm. because there's a value mismatch. Yeah. So if you can put out 25,000, you can't ask for 25,000. If you can spend a hundred, you can't you can get a hundred. And I think that's really that, that that's what I would encourage uh, Daniel, your audience to really think about, to say, at the end of the day, what do you really believe in? Do you really believe that you're here to be mediocre? And no one ever said yes right. to that question. If you're here to be mediocre, go ahead, keep doing what you're doing. But if you feel that you're here for something more, then you're going to have to look for more. And then when more comes, you're going to have to put your, put your big girl pants on and, and say, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Cool. That was good. That was really good. I have been uh, left speeches only a few times on the podcast. And this is one of those times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing that and sharing everything with us today. I think that was extremely high valuable, high value content and conversation. Um, so last question, where can we find more of you? Where can we come hang out and see what you're up to? Yes. So uh, you find me on social media under Growth Architect or under my name, Beate Chalet. And uh, if you heard something, you know, I want to I want to extend this invitation to your listeners, Danielle. If you heard something and you said, I must speak to her, uh, go apply to a complimentary Uncovery Session. I give seven of these away per month and go to UncoverySession.com. And, um, and I'll be happy to, uh, to get on a call. And it takes me about 30, 30 minutes, 45 minutes to figure out 
where the business is stuck and help you to come up with, with the plan on what you need to do next to break through that and really step it up. Um, and uh, as I said, go to the airtightavatar.com to get your avatar in place because that's the foundation for everything. We believe in that so much. We literally give it away for free. And, um, you know, reach out to me on social media, ask questions. We have a YouTube channel. We are in LinkedIn. We're very active on LinkedIn. We have a group on LinkedIn as well. Uh, just, just say hello. I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to hear your takeaways. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we will keep in touch you and I, and, um, guys definitely go give her a follow, but thank you so much for this conversation. This was awesome. Thank you for having me.